All right, welcome to Herkimer Reformed Church's second week of Bible study. We are studying Amos chapter 1 and chapter 2 tonight. So this first part is going to be a little difficult for those of you on the internet, but I will hope maybe be able to put a picture up here or something. Um, I want you all to... We're going to start off with a little bit of a warm-up here. Um, you all play... Pictionary ever? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to start drawing something, and as soon as somebody figures out what it is, you just shout it out. And if you're not sure, but you think you might know, you just shout it out anyway. It's okay. Don't worry about sounding stupid. It's all good. All right. Any guesses yet? <laughs> the waterfall. The waterfall. <laughs> no, 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 not quite yet. Picture frame. Title. How about a book? Music. Radio. Oh, uh -huh. very good, Donna. <laughs> this ain't just any radio, though. No. <laughs> this is the Midland WR300 weather radio, which receives NOAA weather channels and alerts and a wide range of AM and FM uh, channels right here. That's what that is. This is a top-of-the-line <coughs> premium radio. <laughs> Crystal clear reception. But, for one thing, it's missing something. Antenna. For all the technology and all the output that this thing has got, it doesn't do anything without that little antenna on it. You take that antenna off and you turn this thing on, it doesn't matter how high you turn up the volume, what's it going to sound like, Tom? <laughs> it's going to sound like a waterfall. <laughs> White noise. But you put that antenna on it, and it comes in crystal clear. Crystal clear reception. You get all the alerts. If there's going to be a thunderstorm rolling in, the weatherman on there will sound like he is right in that box talking to you. So this antenna here is our prophet. There's all sorts of frequency going over the waves, over the radio waves, and uh, there's all sorts of white noise being projected by this roar from Judah that is God speaking from Judah, roaring like a lion. There's an earthquake there's the top of Mount Carmel drying and withering up. All this stuff is happening, and that's white noise to the people of Israel. And so Amos comes along as the antenna, and he gives God a clear voice to the people. So that's, that's what's going on. That's what I want you to be thinking about as we hear these first two chapters of Amos tonight. Amos and the prophet, all the prophets, are like an antenna to this radio. Chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah, and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion, and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds wither, and the top of Carmel dries up. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus, and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire on the house of Hatzael, and it shall devour the strongholds of Benadad, I will break the gate bars of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Avon, and the one who holds the scepter from Bethaden, and the people of Aram shall go into exile to Kir, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they carried into exile entire communities to hand them over to Edom. So I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, fire that shall devour its strongholds. 
I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashad, and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnants of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they delivered entire communities over to Edom, and did not remember the covenant of kinship. So I will send a fire on the wall of Tyre, fire that shall devour its strongholds. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity. He maintained his anger perpetually and kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire on Taman, and it shall devour the strongholds of Batsra. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the Ammonites and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead in order to enlarge their territory. So I will kindle a fire against the wall of Rabbah, fire that will devour its strongholds with shouting on the day of battle, with a storm on the day of whirlwind. Then their king shall go into exile, he and his officials together, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because he burned to lion the bones of the king of Edom. So I will send a fire on Moab, and it shall devour the strongholds of Kerioth. And Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting, and the sound of the trumpet. I will cut off the ruler from its midst, and I will kill all its officials with him, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they have rejected the law of the Lord, and have not kept his statutes, but they have been led astray by the same lies after which their ancestors walked. So I will send a fire on Judah, and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. Now you said something earlier about the significance of number seven. What's seven mean, Pat? Completion. Seven means completion. How many uh, indictments do you see so far? <laughs> Seven. There are seven <laughs> so far. There are seven. Yeah. And so this prophet who's come up from, uh, from Judah to the north to Israel now to talk to uh, the, is the northern Israelite king. And his court is being received. Okay, go ahead and tell us your case, you wily prophet from Judah. What's going on? Oh, God's speaking to us from Judah. Okay, well, let's hear what he's got to say. Probably some political propaganda. And then we hear... One indictment after another against seven of Israel's, if not out, not if not outright enemies, at least their rival. And Judah is really somebody they would probably consider their enemy, really. Um, so they've they've got the denouncement of seven of their enemies. How do you think they reacted at this point? Pretty ticked off. <laughs> they no. think he's done. Yeah, so but, but how, are they, how are they reacting to this? To what? To this denouncement of their enemies. They're happy. Yeah! Woohoo! Yeah! yeah party! Gonna party! Amos, come, on, come back to the palace for dinner, man. You're going to be my guest of honor. I want to hear you talk, talk smack about my enemies all day, every day. You come mm -hmm. back anytime you want. Everybody is excited and, and cheerful and they're glad and happy. This is the best news ever. Thank you, Amos. We're so glad. But, but wait, he says, hold on, hold on. Quiet your applause for just a moment. I know you think seven signifies completeness, but I'm, I'm actually not done yet. <laughs> I'm actually not done yet, Israel. I've got this to say. Thus says the Lord, verse 6, chapter 2, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, they who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God they drink wine bought with fines they imposed. 
Yet I destroyed the Amorites before them, whose height was like the height of cedars, and whose was as strong as oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, and led you forty years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised up some of your children to be prophets, and some of your youths to be Nazarites. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel, says the Lord? But you have made the Nazarites drink wine, and commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. So I will press you down in your place, just as a cart presses down when it is full of sheaves. Flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not retain their strength, nor shall the mighty save their lives. Those who handle the bow shall not stand, and those who are swift of foot shall not save themselves, nor shall those who ride horses save their lives. And those who are stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, says the Lord. And all God's people said, thanks be to God. Thus says the Lord. So, before I get into the specifics of what each one of these uh, indictments are, I just want to... bring up a little bit of the uh, general formalities of what um, of what's being talked about here. Oh, I don't have an eraser with me today. All right, I'm going to have to squeeze this in then. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> well, there we go. Thus says the Lord. That's how each of these eight denouncements start out. Um, It's not like, dear Pat, (laughs) dear Tom. It's, uh, It's a little bit, not necessarily formal, but it serves an important purpose in that it separates the bearer of the message from the one who is actually has, who has the authority to send this message. Um, in Genesis 32, verse 4, when Jacob sends a message to Esau, he sends he he starts off with, "Thus says your servant Jacob." And so the servant who delivers this is informing uh, Esau that this person here isn't bargaining with him. It's his servant, actually his brother, Jacob, that wants to come to terms with his brother. Um, Judges 11.15, when Jephthah is invited uh, into negotiations with the Ammonite king, his messengers start with, thus says Jephthah. 2 Kings 18.19 when uh, the king of Aram is speaking to Israel, sending is uh, sending messengers, he starts out, "Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria." And so, in none of these cases, even though the uh, people receiving the message want to kill the person who um, who is being spoken with, remember uh, uh, Esau wanted to kill Jacob, even though Jacob. Uh, Esau wants to kill Jacob and he sends messengers. Esau isn't going to kill the messengers because he, they're not the ones saying this. They're not the ones that are here on their own uh, accord to have this conversation. If it was up to them, they'd probably be in the hills somewhere far away from this conflict, minding their own business on a farm, raising some sheep or something, going for a hike, anything but walking up to somebody who's out for blood, but this thus says so-and-so is how they separate the message from the one delivering it. And so this is why Amos can stand face-to-face with the king of northern Israel and say these outright condemning things about him and his people personally, I mean, 
calls the women cows later <laughs> on. Uh, he can do this because he starts out, thus says the Lord. This isn't Amos. I'm, I, listen, you asked last week how are Amos and Satan similar or different. One of the differences is Amos didn't go around looking for accusations. The Satan's job is to find accusation. Amos, his job was breeding sheep and pruning fig trees. God gave him a vision of what was going on and sent him as an ambassador to northern Israel. And so Amos isn't there saying, Hey, King Jeroboam, this is what I see wrong in your country. And if you want my advice, the way we do things in Judah, and actually they didn't quite live up to that either. You can see they're on the list of uh, condemned uh, nations here too. Um, now, he says, this is what God has noticed about you. And, you know, I, I don't want to be here telling you this any more than you necessarily want to hear this. But God has commissioned me to come here and tell you this. So, here it is. Thus says the Lord. Now, let's go through this because this is, this is something I, I want you to be able to develop uh, for yourselves when you're doing your own personal Bible studies here. Um, your morning devotions or night devotions or afternoon devotions or mid-morning devotions, whatever you like, all of the above. Uh, whenever you see something repeated, a, a, a particular format of words, or even a particular word in general, um, it's, a, it's a rhetorical device used in Scripture commonly to draw our attention into it. So um, let's go through these, um, these nations here that are listed. There were eight of them, right? Um, we've got seven of Israel's neighbors, and then we've got Israel as the eighth down here. Um, what's the what's the first nation that's brought out here? Judah. Uh, before that, in verse chapter one, verse three. We've, we've got, um, Damascus is the city, it's the capital of uh, the Assyrians, or the Arameans. What is it, what, what is their crime? They threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of diamond. They threshed them, do you know what threshing is? Beating. Beating them, yeah. Um... The practice in these days, and we can probably guess because this is what David did to the Arameans. He threshed them. Uh, he put them to hard labor. He put them. He basically enslaved the people in their own neighborhoods, in their own homes. He enslaved them. So the Arameans are enslaving the uh, who is it? The Gileadites um, yeah. in their own homes. Yeah. So. Um, we call that slavery. Um, what is their punishment? Fire. We're going to see that a lot. I hope you pick up on that. <laughs> yeah, fire. God's going to send fire. And one of the things you can assume whenever fire is mentioned in this series is because most of the time when the fire is mentioned, it's mentioned in reference to destruction of fortifications that this is fire that's brought on. This is just, you could maybe even consider this generalized destruction from war. Battles are going to take their place. There isn't going to be peace in these places. This isn't necessarily uh, a free forest fire brought on by lightning or a campfire gone bad. This is fire and destruction intentionally caused by enemies to hamper and destroy infrastructure and defensive fortifications. So God is going to send enemies to Damascus and its neighboring villages and cities and territories to bring fire. What else? Anything? 
he mentions in specific... They're going into exile. Yep, they're going into exile. Exile. He mentions specific destruction, the bars of the gate of Damascus. Anything else? The king. He's going to destroy the king. The king. The oh, yes, yeah, the king is going to be deposed. Yeah. Change of ruler. Anything else? Who's the next one? This is in verse 6 Gaza. Who now Gaza again is the city. Um, it's the seat of, um, the Lith- Philistines. Lithia. Philistia. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Philistines, and, um, they are Israel's ancient blood rivals. <laughs> I mean, there's just so much bad blood there. They are, they're, um, they're, they're always the problem through First and Second Samuel. And half of judges, at least. Um, in fact, the Philistine occupation that starts uh, in the time of Samson, uh, you remember most judges, they come up, they completely overthrow the oppressors, and then there's a period of peace. Samson, as a judge, starts out, starts to overthrow the Philistines, but never actually finishes that. And so the Philistines are constantly oppressing uh, Israel, even up until the time that Samuel appoints Saul as king and then even then he never really finishes off the Philistines because David in the next in the succession of the kingship is still fighting the Philistines so and even now yeah why is it that people now call some other people Philistines or Philistines what does that mean uh, it just it's I don't kind of it. means like a persistent foe oh. in that so and because of that reason they're just a they're the archetypal persistent foe, like uh, Superman's Lex Luthor is his Philistine, basically. He's just kind of this enemy that won't go away. Just won't go away. That's my guess, anyway. I, I've actually I, I asked that question a, a few times in my life, and that's kind of the answer that I found, that it, it, it just means that. It's a persistent foe that won't go away. So... Um, what do we have? What's their crime here? What's the Philistines' crime? It's slavery again. Oh, it's slavery again. Very astute observation. They call it something else. What, what do they call it? They, they say specifically um, because they carried into exile into entire exile. communities to hand them over to Edom. Edom. Edom, right. Who's Edom? Esau. It's the descendants of Esau, yeah. They're, um, they're cousins to the Israelites. Uh, Israel's brother was Esau, who became the progenitor of the Edomites. He actually makes this list later on, we'll see. Oddly enough, he makes the list too. So the Philistines are selling entire communities into slavery to the Edomites. So they're, they're picking them up, relocating them even, possibly. I don't know, it doesn't really say necessarily. Maybe they're just outsourcing some slavery for the, uh, the Edomites, the middlemen. Um, what is, uh, what is their crime? I mean, what is their, what is their sentence? How are they being paid back for this? Fire. Oh, well, look at that. Yeah. Common crime, common punishment. What else do we have? Got mm-hmm. exile. Remnants of the Philistines shall perish. The king. Death. Exile, change of king. Mm. Yeah, so it's uh, it's it's what the Arameans had, and then some. What about the third, the third nation that's addressed? This is a um, this is a Phoenician city state. Um, Back in the north again. We can call it Tyre because it, the. Three main Phoenician city states were more or less independent um, from each other at the time. 
Um, what did they do? Didn't remember covenant of kinship. Yep. What did they? What's the? Uh, what did they do in particular in disregard to that covenant of kinship? They did the same things the yeah. Philistines they did. They delivered entire communities over to Edom. More slavery. <laughs> slavery. The Edom. Edomites are yeah, you ever you, you love it when when people say, "Oh, the Bible condones slavery." <laughs> yeah, if, fat chance if you ever direct mm-hmm. them towards Amos of <laughs> uh, saying that. Um, and they do something else that Pat pointed out. They ignore the covenant of kinship. What do you think that has to do with? They must be close relatives of. Well, Israel, Judah. you should you should check that. Yeah, you should mm-hmm. check and see if they're close relatives. Uh, they're not as close relatives. If you go back and you check the family tree from Noah onward back in Genesis, they're not as close as the Edomites are. Uh, my book says it probably refers to a political treaty. Yes, that's what I'm going to guess. When we were studying Second Samuel, uh, what happens when David conquers for himself the city of Jebus? And renames it Jerusalem. The king of Tyre, in a gesture of goodwill, sees, whoa, there's this new king in town, and he's setting up a new capital, and he's just conquering cities like it's all right. He's setting up his capital there. He's uniting these 12 tribes of Israel into a powerful nation just south of my border. I'm going to make friends with him. I'm going to send carpenters and masons down there with with the the best cedar lumber from my territory, and I'm going to build him a house. Mm -hmm. And they go down there and they build him uh, a a cedar palace in Jerusalem, and they make friends with him. Yeah, and so David goes on this, uh, you know, conquering expansion scheme, and uh, they leave the they leave the, the Phoenicians alone. Because there's this assumption that the the Tyrian king and David had some sort of friendship going on. Yeah. So now it turns out they've just decided to disregard that. They're ignoring that. And so perhaps the people that it's taking as um, slaves and selling to Edom are very likely Israelites. So they're ignoring that kinship covenant, and they're taking Israelites as slaves. Um, what's their punishment? Fire. fire. You don't even have to look. Do you? you don't even have to look. It's just fire. Fire. That same fire that comes from destruction, from battle and siege. Fire that shall devour its strongholds. And that's all they get. That's all it says. You're just... You're getting fire and destruction. Who's next on the list? Edom. Oh, there we go. Israel's cousin. The one that's been profiting from all this slave trade that the Philistines and the Tyrians are doing. They're sending slaves to Edom. Uh, what's, What's God's beef with Edom here? It's kind of vague, isn't it? It kind of sounds, uh, you know, Edom is personified in this case. The whole nation is given this trait as a, as a person. He says, um, because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity, he maintained his anger perpetually and kept his wrath forever. Um, it, it kind of sounds like when Esau was chasing Jacob to kill him. Uh, but we know they made nice, right? Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps this is um, this ongoing hostility, some sort of toxic relationship of some kind between the nation of Edom and the nation of Israel. There might just be some kind of toxic, persistent uh, bad blood here right now that this is referring to. And, uh, yeah, he's pursuing him with the sword, so maybe there were some border skirmishes and disputes that could have been started for any number of petty reasons. This person's sheep were grazing on my lawn. 
this and that. So somebody killed somebody, and the next thing you know, they've got a tribal border warfare go- war going on. <clears throat> um, so, um, let's say their crime is they were mean. <laughs> we don't really know specifically what they did, but they were, sums it up. They, were, they were angry. They were mean. They were angry. Yeah. Um, yeah, maintained his anger perpetually and kept his wrath forever. Which makes it sound like if they had just let it go, they didn't even need to say they were sorry. They could have just stopped escalating. How often do we get in conflicts where it's like, you could just say you're sorry and fix it, but... No, you'd rather just keep pushing a little bit further because you're not happy yet. You're not satisfied yet. You This is personal. You want to make the other person suffer. Mm-hmm. And so that's what Edom's doing here. As a nation, they're just being plain mean. They're perpetuating their anger. They're not letting it rest. And so what's their what's their punishment? Fire. Fire. Oh, what do you Fire. know? Fire. And we get a few specific places named... T man. T man. T man. That's uh, Mr. T's father. <laughs> a pity the fool that maintains his anger perpetually. Um, <laughs> a team, anybody? No? Yeah. Okay. Uh, who's number five on the list? Ammonites. We've got the Ammonites. Ammonites. Yeah, they're, so, so um, yeah, let, me, let me just give you this general map here. There's uh, the coast of the eastern. Mediterranean, not bad if I do say so myself. You've got um, you've got Israel here, you've got Judah here, you've got the Phoenicians here, the Philistines here, the um, oh the Arameans are up here. No, the Philistines are over on the, the f- south southwest. Yep, they're right on the coast here. Philistines are. are Philistines are here. Edom is Edom. South. Is over here. Moab is here. Um, who do we have? The Ammonites, they're a little bit further up here. And the Ammonites are right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Before you get to the Aram. So you've kind of got this, uh, this nice little spiral that, um, that Amos is working on. And then he... You might think, so they might think, oh, he's coming from Judah, he's going to land on us, but he doesn't. He backtracks, and he goes, he really makes, like, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a Fibonacci spiral almost, and it comes right back down on Jerusalem, <laughs> much to their delight, but then they find out he's not done once he's done with, once he names Israel. So what's, uh, what's he say about the Ammonites here? What do they do? He ripped open pregnant women. Yeah. To enlarge their territory. You call that fratricide? Fratricide? Yeah, because it's your brother. That's killing a brother. Infanticide. Is Infanticide. Killing. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not good with Latin. They didn't teach us that in seminary. Yeah, they did in high school. <laughs> Infanticide. <laughs> This is fratricide like right that. here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Edom, Edom's doing fratricide. Uh, the Ammonites are doing infanticide. Thank you. See, this is what I really love about teaching, is when I get to learn from the students, really. That's the best part. Um, they're practicing infanticide. They are killing pregnant women and their babies. Um, for the sake of enlarging their territory. How does that work? I don't get that. You don't get that? No. You're having trouble picturing or you just can't understand why people would do that? I can't understand I, why they do that. Yeah. I can't understand how it how enlarges their in, territory. Yeah, right? how it increases okay. their territory. All right, this is, this is what they're doing. You want to take your neighbor's lawn or yard and house. Um, so you kill your neighbor, but you leave his wife and kids because they'll work, they'll keep the lawn nice, they'll keep the flowers planted, and they'll keep the land nice for you, so you don't have to work it, but you get to reap all the profits from it. But the thing is, you know, 
that little kid that wasn't a threat to you when you killed the, the father, he's going to grow up someday and come and get revenge on you. Yes. So what was a common practice in these days for making sure that the uh, next generation didn't fight back against the conquerors was they'd kill the children. And so uh, that's what the Egyptians did to the Israelites when they were in bondage down in Israel. That was one of their steps that they took to keep them weak and keep them from fighting back against the Egyptians. Um, and it's a just it's a really aggressive way of really making sure that a territory is subdued. So if they're if you're not you're not just killing the soldiers that are out to fight against you, you're killing the women and their unborn babies. That means you're not looking to exploit that land. You're looking to move into the neighborhood yourself now. Okay. So that's why that's what it's why it makes that specific reference to increase their territory. They're not threshing them like the Arameans were. They're moving right in. Okay. That's so that's what that's a reference to. Does that help clarify? We yep. still can't understand. <laughs> they're they're just bad dudes doing yeah, this. Sounds... Uh you know, but but this is this is that um that, that bit of cane that's in all of us. And I think uh to say that these are somehow monsters might be more comforting for us because it helps separate us from them a little bit. But I think we need to realize that these are man, cats really bother me. Um, <laughs> but there's this potential for evil in just about anybody in the right circumstances. Um, and so this is something we've got to constantly be on guard about. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Thanks for protecting me from that cat there. Um, what's their punishment for doing this? Uh, Without looking, I bet it's fire. Without fire even looking. Again, yeah. yeah, sure enough. Verse 14, I will yeah. kindle fire against the walls of Rava. Yeah, more fire. Um, refers to and shouting the king shall go into exile. Going to mm-hmm. exile. Exile. Yeah. Yeah. And his officials together, all the aristocracy. Mm-hmm. Who is next? We've got the Moabites. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now. If the Ammonites are doing cruelty to people before they're even born, what's that on the other end of the spectrum here? We get to see that brought out by the Moabites. Burning the dead. They're burning the bones burning the of bones. a king. king. They're, they're inflicting cruelty even after the poor guy's dead. Yeah. He's already dead. And this is, uh, this is something interesting here. Um, they burned him into lime. Uh, this this thing in Hebrew, when I look it up in the lexicon, it, it leads me in this direction to believe that this is uh, they're they're making his bones into plaster to paint the walls with, mm. is what they're doing. Wow. So so they're taking their enemy. They killed him. They tortured him. Cut his eyes out. Quartered him. Drawn him. And they burn his bones to lime, and then they paint the kitchen walls with them. That's what they're doing with this, with the king of, um, of Edom. So, Moab is kind of already, um, they've already dealt some punishment on Edom, but God says, eh, that was a bit excessive. <laughs> that was a bit excessive. I gotta, I gotta call you out on that and say, that was excessive. You're gonna have to pay for that. Um, the study Bible says desecration and disrespect. So that's well, that would go in line with using the bones for paint. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little disrespectful. Yeah, and desecrating it. Yeah, apparently, um, avoiding giving them a, a proper burial right. is disrespectful. Right. Yes, right. that's that's something uh, that I brought up the last time. These aren't these aren't things that are uh, necessarily prohibited in the Torah. But they are things that um, Amos is drawing out to people's attention that these are just universally bad things. Mm-hmm. Everybody recognizes these as wrong. Them, yeah. yeah. So this is everybody can see that this is cruel. Everybody can see that this is cruel. 
ripping babies out of their mother's stomach with the intent to kill them both is just... Yeah. Who does that? Um, Edom. They're just being mean. Tyre, Philistines, Arameans. Threshing. This isn't... He's not talking about economic debt slavery or anything like that. He's talking about threshing. Cruel slavery. These are all issues that he's bringing up. He's appealing to people's universal or innate sense of morality that just says these are just wrong things to do. Now, what do you suppose their punishment is? Fire. 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 Yeah. Fire. Anything else? Exile for the ruler. Exile. What What does that mean? Exile means no, no, that not that. Oh. It says it cut off the ruler from its midst. Uh, that's that means exile. Oh, just yeah. exile. Okay. Yeah. yeah, cut him off means that he's he's going to go somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. And then it says, and then, so he's going to get exiled and then killed. Then they're going to slay him, yeah, yeah, along with all these princes. Yeah. All his officials, yeah. And now, now we come down to seven, and they might be well expecting that the condemnation is going to land on them, but to their temporary relief, it lands on who? Judah. 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 So this prophet from Judah isn't coming in all high and mighty and holier than thou. Because he's got condemnation from God for his own nation here. And what are, what is Judah's crimes here? Rejected the law. They rejected the law. They lied. Righteousness or silver? Uh, Not quite yet. That's Israel. The northern tribes. Oh, sorry. Sorry, right. all right. I jumped down. You're jumping ahead of us here, Donna. Um, yeah. Now, now we get into. Um, do you think Moab is rejecting the law of God? Yeah. Do you think Do you think Tyre is rejecting the statutes of God? Do you think the Arameans yeah, are. are lying? Yeah, everybody's doing these things, yes. but they aren't going to care if if a Judean prophet condemns them for that. They're going to be like, so what? So what? But here's the thing. Here's the thing about God's election of Israel and deliverance of Israel from Egypt. He didn't just do that uh, for the sake of showing off, for the sake of pampering them. Election carries with it An election to responsibility. You're elect for a job. You're called called for a job. When God called each of you in your narratives that you described, God wasn't calling out to you to say hi. He was calling you for a specific job. Whether he wanted you to hold back that night. Whether he wanted you to say something to a church. Whether he wanted you to write a check to a ministry around the world. Whether he wanted to tell you to stay out of bars and stop (laughs) flirting with loose men. (laughs) He called you through a specific purpose. This is what he did with with Israel, with Judah. He says, this is my law. You want to thank me for bringing you up out of slavery? Here, you can thank me by being a light to the nations. Be sanctified by my law. Follow my law. Observe my statutes. Walk in truth. And you'll live long and you'll prosper in the land and you'll be a light to the nations. You'll, you'll be blessed. You'll, you're blessed now to be a blessing to everybody else because everyone else, I've set you at this, this spot here is the crossroads of three continents. I've put you in the center of most of the world to be an example to everybody else because everybody's going to be traveling. Europeans, Africans, Asians, they're going to meet and converge in this location and when they do, I want them to see a holy nation of priests right here obeying my law, observing my statutes, and walking in the truth. And that's why I called you up out of slavery. That's why I delivered you with a mighty hand. That's why I hardened Pharaoh's heart. That's why I visited plagues on the Egyptians. That's why I parted the Red Sea. That's why I fed you through the desert. That's why I delivered you into this land. It was so that you could do this. And you've 
ignored it. You've rejected the law of the Lord. You've not kept his statutes. You've been led astray by perpetuating the same lies that your ancestors fabricated. So, God's holding these people to a higher standard because he has invested more in them. He's put more into them, so he expects to get more out of them. And so, yeah, they're not doing things like slavery, 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 being mean, infanticide, post-death cruelty. They're not, they're not doing things like that necessarily, but what they are doing is enough to evoke God's anger. What is their punishment? Fire. Fire. Can you believe that? It's the same as everybody else. God, it's like God is being unfair here. Is he being unfair? He's, he's really holding them to a high standard. Now, Israel might be relieved, thinking, oh, good, seven, he's done. But they might be thinking, oh my goodness, if they're being called out for that stuff, imagine what he's got to say about us. They should be, right? <laughs> they should be worried. If God's calling Judah out for these things, imagine the standard he's going to hold us to that have heard of Christ. When we've seen the fullness of God made known to us in these last days by his Son. Imagine, the stand, imagine what he expects out of us. It's not without grace. It's not without mercy. That's part of the good news. But God does expect a lot out of us. That's why he says, pick up your cross and walk up the hill. So if he's making, if he's setting Israel up to be the model, the the chosen people, the elected, um, and he wants all the neighbors all the way around to see them as a model of justice. What they're going to see, since they're not keeping the laws that he set, for, they're going to get the same punishment. They're all going to get fired. You're you're looking ahead, aren't you? And thinking, uh, you're you're seeing a pattern here, aren't you, Don? Yeah. <laughs> You're really good at that. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. That's... I mean, really, to look at that, though, the way you are, I, I see the scientists in you coming out right now. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's got to be a reason for that. You're reasoning this. Yeah. Fire, 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 fire. So let's well, look see, at. See, you have presented the data <laughs> appropriately. This is. It's not in, in narrative form. <laughs> now we have a data now chart. That, now that I've got it in graph form. form. Yeah, so like... Fire, 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 fire. Okay, then there's a reason for that fire down there, and it goes with that drawing right up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Conclusion. Uh, the, the heat the heat rises. <laughs> yeah, it's going to come right back up to Israel yeah. now. Yeah, so let's now let's look at Israel, because uh, um, Amos has got something to say about each of these people, but he spends most of the time now on Israel. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not revoke the punishment. Oh, by the way, I, I didn't mention this in the beginning, but this is... Um, this is something that really confused me. I does anybody have any um, any ideas of what this for three transgressions and for four recipe is all Just about? Just means it's enough. I looked that up. What three, do you have? three is enough, and four is more than enough. Yeah. Four is it's like enough. the last straw. Yeah. 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 And yeah. and it's a, a device. It's not that he's going to list three. Mm -hmm. Three means enough, and four is yeah. Your Bible says the same thing. Yeah. More than enough. Yeah, it's more than yeah. enough. And yeah. so, all right, that's more than enough. I've had you've, it with you. You've it's, done. Yeah, it's, I've, yeah. it's God's that's way of enough. saying I've had it up to here yeah. with you. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, it's an yeah. idiom for I've had it up to here with you. Yeah. yeah. If you said that, and if you translated that into Hebrew, it wouldn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but that's essentially what he's saying here. 
Okay, so for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver. This isn't just any old slavery right here. This is they're selling oh, Christ. They're selling the righteous. They're selling their own messiahs. They're selling the righteous for silver. They're selling the needy for a pair of sandals. They're not even getting a good deal on them. They're just taking what they can get for them. They trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. So, people who are sick, people who are fleeing abuse, people who um, are troubled in some way. Are the orphans and widows? People who are yards. orphaned yeah, and they're widows. Not, they're not they're taking care of them. pushing them out of the way. Yeah. Father and son go into the same girl. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. There are specific prohibitions in Deuteronomy about taking garments in pledge because a person giving their clothes in pledge of a loan, that means that's all they have. They're, you're not allowed to loan money to somebody with the clothes they have as collateral. Because they're already in a desperate situation. They may not be great with money to begin with. And so you're really taking advantage of them to get every last thing away from them by even entering into this agreement to begin with. It's just not right. So they're taking clothes in pledge and they're just using them for bedding. So they've got so much of it. They're doing, they've got a heap of clothes in their bedroom that they just lay down on every night. This is picture Scrooge McDuck swimming through his, uh, his vault of money. That's, that's what these people are doing. Clothes are money to these people. They're swimming in money that they've stolen from people that because they, and I'm going to use the word stolen. Yeah, they might have legally entered into this contract, but it wasn't right for them to enter into that relationship, that contract to begin with. It was wrong to establish that agreement in the first place. And then they followed through with it. They took advantage of it. And then they yanked those clothes away as collateral. And now they've got uh, whatever money they lost in the loan. But now they've got everything that that person owns. The next thing, the next step is they sell that person now for a pair of sandals also. So they're really, really, really mistreating the poor. Um... <coughs> There's all kinds of father, son, threesomes going on here. There's just just detestable things going on. Um, and these are, um, you know, I, I think I think it, it, it in some ways these are ignorable crimes. These are quiet crimes, you know. If you are driving along and you see a person under an overpass with a sign that says, need anything, much appreciated, and you drive on by, police aren't going to come and say, hey, you didn't give alms to that poor person back there. You know, if a father and son are going into the same girl in their own household, maybe the neighbors are going to feel uncomfortable to even bring it up. This isn't going to be something, this is, this is one of those, well, they do it in private, so it's not hurting anybody. This is what they do in private, so it doesn't hurt anybody. They just, maybe they were late today, and they didn't have time to stop and open their wallet for that poor person they saw. These are really quiet, private, and often easily excusable crimes by human standards of justice. But God is really, again, lifting his standard high and saying, this is my standard of righteousness. If you can't be faithful in small things, you're not going to be faithful in larger things. 
If you are unfaithful with how you treat the poor, how are you going to treat my Messiah? How are you going to treat my son? God's looking at this right now, and so, you know, that's what makes, that's what makes Christ's incarnation all the more remarkable. God has seen throughout history how humanity has treated the, um, the defenseless, the poor, the people who don't have advocates, the people who don't have parents, the people who don't have husbands, the people who don't have any standing in society, and he actually came to us as one of those. The son of unmarried parents in a foreign land. He went right to Egypt first thing. Grew up in Egypt as a foreigner. A foreigner to illegitimately born parents thing situation. He came as one of them. Dirt poor. When he died, he didn't even have enough money for his own grave. His rich uncle had to come by and spot him a tomb. So the remarkable thing about Christ's incarnation is God has looked at this throughout history and seen the way that humanity has treated people. Our capacity for cruelty, downright cruelty, without the law of God, and still falling far short with the law of God. When we hear the news that the King has come, joy to the world, the Lord has come, that's not necessarily joy to the world right away. The fact that the king has come should terrify us. It should terrify us because of these things right here. Because of the promise of fire, destruction. The king coming sounds like bad news until you realize that the king has come to die for his rebellious subjects. The king has come, and he's come to die for his rebellious subjects. That's why it's good news. It's bad news first. There's death on the cross on Friday. Then comes resurrection. The gospel is always bad news. Whatever way you look at it, it's bad news before it's good news. And that's the way Amos delivers his prophecy too. Today, we're in chapter 2. We're just finishing up chapter 2. And it's all bad news at first. It's going to be bad news for the next couple of weeks we get together. Um, but it doesn't end without God showing his grace, his mercy, opportunity for repentance, the fact that he's not given up yet. Now, what can we learn about God by these indictments, denouncements, what... What can we? What is God revealing about Himself to the Israelites that they may not have known, and that we as Americans might need to be reminded of today? Because so he's really interested. In, what's that? He's really interested in people. God is really interested in international affairs, certainly mm -hmm. people, right down to the really nitty gritty details. God is watching, as your sign says. I saw that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, God is really interested. Um, I think justice. What's that? Justice. God wants. God demands justice. Yeah. What do you have, Paul? Evidently, God wants the sinners to know that everyone else is also in trouble too, and you're not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Hell is not going to be a lonely place. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 and you know what? Um, when we talk about unity in the church, um, you know, there's so many petty things that can divide us. Um, ultimately, I find that I can work together with people um, that see at the top of things a desire to care for and safeguard the welfare, well-being of the church and the proclamation of the gospel. If we see that as primary of, of primary importance... You and I can work very well together, even though we can disagree on a myriad of other things. But here's the thing also, down beneath all of that, we're also united very strongly in the fact that we are both existential sinners that fall far short of the glory of God. And so at the top and the bottom, we're very strongly united in, that, in those ways. And yet, um, Amos is pointing out some serious unity here 
with all these nations. You're all going to burn unless you turn, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, so they're united in their shortcomings, for sure. Yeah. Um, this is really revolutionary in many ways for its time, especially, and even for today in some ways. Um, the Lord... is, sorry, my Hebrew spelling is backwards sometimes, I'm dyslexic, you got to write it from the other way. The Lord is God of Israel, the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, but evidently, he's the God of all of this. This is unheard of at this time. These other nations have got their own local gods, sometimes a few of them, one for each block in their city. The fact that there's one God claiming sovereignty over all of these nations is, um, is a huge leap forward from this kind of theism that these people are practicing. This notion that there is one God who's going to universally judge all the nations. And he's actually at work in their history. He's actually going to bring about judgment in fire and destruction and exile and all of this stuff. All these things that are happening to their neighbors, they're saying, wow, our God is really powerful, really far-reaching. He's reaching outside of our borders and affecting I thought he only took revenge on those people when they did stuff to us. He's taking revenge on them and they're doing stuff to our enemies. The enemy of an enemy is a friend, right? God, can't we can't we cut can't we cut Moab some slack here? They only burned Edom, who you were mad at already anyway. But no, God is bigger than their personal concerns. I think in a lot of ways, Israel had developed this national civil theology, national civil theology where God is their patron deity. He's less a god and more of a mascot. He's more of their mascot. And so their national policy is just automatically God's national policy. God is with us. And so everything we do has got God's blessing. Gott mit uns is the slogan of the German army, the traditional slogan of the German army through World War I and World War II. Gott mit uns, God with us. I can't pronounce the Russian version of that, but it was the same thing for the Russian army too. And they fought each other on the battle, and that should tell you something right there. You can't be with both sides. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, we put, in God we trust on our currency. We put, God bless America on billboards. When Amos is saying, rather, God is not your personal deity here. He's much bigger than that. Your national policy isn't necessarily God's national policy. Check yourself. So, I think that's Amos's prophetic message for our nation today. Um, does God elect our rulers and direct our nation's affairs? Absolutely, he's got his hand in that. But it doesn't mean he's agreeing with the pride and where that leads us sometimes into believing that uh, God is subservient to us, that God is just going along with us, that we can do something that's got God's approval right away. Um, Amos is calling Israel and all of us 
before we do something, before we decide on something, to turn to God in prayer, to turn to God in repentance and say, God, I can't make the right decision without your right guidance. So send me your word, send me your Holy Spirit, help guide me, help me discern, and ultimately call me to right action. That should be our prayer. God, call us to right action. Call us to righteousness. Call us to be makers of justice before you make justice yourself in the form of fire by burning everything that's not just. So any other questions, comments, criticisms?